Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> We're in Joshua chapter 5 this morning. And for the invariable people that will comment, Barry, you look tired. It's first thing in the morning here. I've had that much coffee so far. And um, I work 15 to 18 hours a day. So, yeah, thanks for the observation. Joshua, chapter 5. Please get your Bibles out. Do not subcontract your faith to me. And it came to be when all the sovereigns, the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan westward, and all the sovereigns of the Canaanites, the kings of the Canaanites, who were by the sea, heard that Yahuwah, the Lord your God, had dried up the water, waters of the Jordan from before the children of Israel, until we had passed over, that their hearts melted, and there was no spirit in them any longer, because of the children of Israel. First of all, I like the inclusion until we had passed over that's cool and it speaks to the writer the author of this having been participatory participated in this crossing and for those of you who weren't here Last week, I would encourage you to go back and read Joshua 3 and Joshua 4 with us, which was last week's Old Testament video, talking about the crossing of the Jordan at Gilgal, Gilgal, however you want to pronounce it, and that uh, the river ran dry the moment the priests of Yahuwah carrying the Ark of the Covenant stepped into the river, it stopped, and the Israelites crossed on dry land got to the other side, and then the priests came back out of the water, and the moment their foot came out of the riverbed, whoosh, the water started pouring again. At that time, Yahuwah said to Yehoshua, to Joshua, make knives of flint for yourself and circumcise the sons of Israel again the second time. That one statement, again the second time, is enough to cause people who don't read their Bibles, or who are not good at reading their Bibles, to become very confused. Because wait a minute, all the children of Israel have already been circumcised. Let's keep reading. So, Yehoshua, Joshua, made knives of flint for himself and circumcised the sons of Israel at the hill of foreskins. And this is why, and this is why, and this is why Joshua circumcised them. All the people who came out of Mitzrayim who were males, all the men of battle had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Mitzrayim. For all the people who came out had been circumcised. But all the people who were born in the wilderness on the way, as they came out of Mitzrayim, had not been circumcised. For the children of Israel walked forty years in the wilderness, till all the nation, the men of battle who came out of Mitzrayim, were consumed, because they did not obey the voice of Yahuwah, to whom Yahuwah swore not to show them the land which Yahuwah had sworn to their fathers, that he would give us a land flowing with milk and honey. Again, the us there, inclusive. And Joshua circumcised their sons whom he raised up in their place, for they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. So the original Israelites that had been circumcised died off. And after wandering in the wilderness for four years, there was a whole bunch of new dudes that hadn't been circumcised yet. So that's what they did. They circumcised those guys. And as a brief aside, we can flip to uh, Exodus 12, 48. 12, 48. 
which is page 70 in the scriptures, by the way. And when a stranger sojourns with you and shall perform the Pesach, the Passover, to Yahuwah, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near and perform it. And he shall be as a native of the land, but let no uncircumcised eat of it. There is one Torah for the native born and for the stranger who sojourns among you. There is one Torah for the native and the stranger who sojourns among you. Exodus 12, 48. So, here, regarding the Pesach, the Passover, let all his males be circumcised, and let him, and then let him come near and perform the Passover. Why be circumcised? Okay, well, Genesis seventeen thirteen. Flip back a few more pages. Seventeen verse thirteen. This is Yah talking to Abram, Avraham. Starting in verse 9. And Elohim said to Abraham, As for you, guard my covenant, you and your seed after you, throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you guard between me and you, and your seed after you. Every male child among you is to be circumcised, and you, can, you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall become a sign of the covenant between me and you. And the son of eight days is circumcised by you, every male child in your generations. He who was born in your house or bought with silver from any foreigner who is not of your seed. He who was born in your house and he who is bought with your silver has to be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And an uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin his life shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So the covenant between Abraham and Yah, Yahuwah, was established through the circumcision of his foreskin. There is a lot of lore, a lot of human traditions and lore and uh, doctrines around this. That's what the book says. I don't care about traditions of man. Good morning, gorgeous. Um, now, let's go even further, because we're here, right? Because I can hear some of you out there, wait a minute, I'm uncircumcised. What does that mean for me? Let's flip to the book of Acts. John Messiah. Acts 15, I believe, Acts 15, yep, Acts 15, 15, which is page 1071 in your scriptures. This is New Testament after the time of Yeshua here on earth. And the words of the prophet agree, and a little setup here, the, the early church, the assembly of believers, which were righteous men, meaning they kept the commands of Yah, the Yehudim who believed in Yeshua, was having a heated discussion, if not argument amongst themselves. Do these Gentile believers, these believers in Messiah who are not Yehudim, who are not Hebrew, what do they need to do to believe? Which is an interesting concept. What do they need to do to believe? Which is... That's a workspace theology. It's also what your Bible says from its first page to its last page. What do you need to do to believe? Just as a body without a soul is dead, so is faith without works dead. James 2 verse 14 on to the end of the chapter. And so they're going back and forth. What do we do with these Gentile believers? And so starting at Acts 15, verse 15. 
And the words of the prophets agree with this, as it has been written, After this I shall return and rebuild the booth of David, which has fallen down, and I shall rebuild its ruins, and I shall set it up, so that the remnant of mankind shall seek Yahuwah, even all the nations on whom my name has been called, all the nations on whom my name has been called, says Yahuwah, who is doing all this, who has made this known from old. Therefore I judge that we should not trouble those from among the nations, the non-Hebrew believers in Messiah. Therefore I judge we should not trouble those from among the nations who are turning to Elohim, but that we write to them to abstain from the defilement, idols, defilement of idols, and from whoring, and from what is strangled, and from blood. For from ancient generations Moshe has in every city those proclaiming him being read in the congregations every Sabbath. And so their answer here was not necessary. And I mean, you could look at verse 5, and we will. Their answer here is to whether or not it was necessarily necessary for these Gentile believers in Messiah to be circumcised was no. No. Their, their belief was that for the Gentile believers in Messiah, they did not need to be circumcised to believe in Yeshua. Jesus, who does what? Brings us back to the Father. Hebrews 8.8, 8, the renewed covenant. But they did say... No whoring, no idolatry, no strangulation, no blood, and go to the temple on the Sabbath and hear the words of Moses. In the New Testament, after Yeshua had been crucified. Right there in black and white. So, if we look at verse 5, And some of the believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees rose up believers... Believers in Yeshua who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees rose up saying it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the Torah of Moshe. Okay. You can read this whole Acts 15 is very, very interesting reading. Now then, why do you try Elohim by putting a yoke on the neck of the taught ones which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But through the favor, the grace of the Master Yeshua, Messiah, we must trust to be saved in the same way as they. Now remember, this is the Pharisees that Paul and Barnabas are talking to here. Not that the Father's law was the issue. It was what the Pharisees had done to the Father's law. This is why Yeshua was constantly railing against them. The burden they created out of the law. And so the result here, and the crowd was silent, and they were listening to Barnabas and Shaul, to Paul, declaring how many miracles and wonders Elohim has done among the nations. And then, and after they were silent, Yahob, James, answered, saying, Men, brothers, listen to me. Simon has declared how Elohim first visited his nation, the nations to take out of them a people for his name. Right? Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the nations who are turning to Elohim. James, James the Just, Yaakov, Yeshua's blood brother, very practical, tactical. If you're having a hard time, like, walking in faith, just go read the book of James. I mean, it, it's a quick read, and it's so applicable. So, great guy to render judgment here. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the nations who are turning to Elohim, but that we write to them to abstain from the defilement of idols, Torah, and from whoring, Torah, and from what is strangled, Torah, and from blood, Torah. For from ancient generations Moshe has, in every city, those proclaiming him being read in the congregations every Sabbath. And so, the Pharisees were saying, it is necessary to circumcise them. The Pharisaical believers in Yeshua, they were righteous men. Well, they might not have been righteous men because they were Pharisees who had adulterated the law. But they were Pharisees and they kept and they had a belief in Yeshua. I know that's mind blowing because the whole time we've been taught, well, see, the Pharisees murdered Yeshua. Yes, they were a group of people. 
and some of them were in that group that murdered Yeshua. But there were also others in that group that in no way murdered Yeshua. They believed on him. They believed on his name. Okay? So, the Pharisees that believed in Yeshua had said here, it is necessary to circumcise them and command them to keep the Torah of Moshe. Paul and Barnabas give testimony, James judges, and they say, you know what? No strangulation, no whoring, no blood, no idolatry, but go to the temple on the Sabbath and hear what Moshe has to say. Not what the Pharisees have to say the law is, but go to the temple on the Sabbath and hear what Moshe has to say. Okay. That's a really good resolution as far as I'm concerned. So if you are a Hebraic descendant of uh, Abraham, circumcise. If you're a Gentile from among the nations, not necessary. You end up with what is called the circumcision of the heart. So if you want to get wrapped around the axles on it, you can get wrapped around the axles on it. If you don't, you don't need to, is my judgment and the judgment of myriad brethren within my particular faith group, which many people say, Bear, what do you believe? Well, the leader of my religion is Yeshua, is Jesus, and my doctrine is the Torah. Proverbs 6, 4, for I give you good Doctrine, forsake not my Torah. Because that's what's in the Bible. That's what I do. But at Hebrew roots, maybe. I'm not messianic. There's a really great documentary called The Way. The Way documentary. It explains a lot about how I believe. And if you're new here, you can check out um, Zach at New to Torah. The word new, the number two, the word Torah, T-O-R-A-H. Website, uh, YouTube channel, so forth and so on. Really good YouTube videos. But I digress. So let's flip back to Joshua 5. Now that we've spent 18 minutes talking about circumcision, which everybody loves. It's a, it's a hot topic, man. That's right. Everybody. They're like, elections, rioting, circumcision... Hey, Weez. She's on the front porch. Everybody's up early this morning. All right. So, go back to Joshua 5, verse 7. And Joshua, Yehoshua, circumcised their sons, whom he raised up in their place, meaning the people who had died off in the wilderness, for they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. And it came to be when they had completed circumcising all the nation that they stayed in their place in the camp till they were healed. So they crossed the river, circumcised, and then they hold up for a little while. Because a whole bunch of dudes just got their foreskins cut off. It's probably not a good idea to be going into battle uh, with a, a healing foreskin. I could see that as a good idea. And Yahuwah said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Mitzrayim from you. So the name of the place is called Gilgal to this day. And the children of Israel camped in Gilgal and performed the Pesach, the Passover, on the 14th day of the noon moon at evening on the plains of Jericho. Flip over to Numbers 9. Numbers 9. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe in the wilderness of Sinai in the first new moon of the second year after they had come out of the land of Mitzrayim saying, Now let the children of Israel perform the Pesach at its appointed time. So they did the Passover in Exodus 12 before they left Mitzrayim. And then they get into the wilderness, and on the first new moon of the second year after they had come out of Mitzrayim, so two years later, 
they're commanded to do the Passover again. Okay? So they, on the 14th day of the new moon, between evenings, perform it at the appointed time. According to all its laws and right rulings, you perform it. And Moshe spoke to the children of Israel to perform the Pesach. And so they performed the Pesach on the 14th day of the first new moon between the evenings in the wilderness of Sinai, according to all that Yahuwah had commanded Moshe, so the children of Israel did. Okay. So, Passover feast before Exodus 12, before they leave Mitzrayim, before they leave Egypt, the destroyer passes through the angel of death, whatever you want to use, whatever translation you like, comes through and kills all the firstborn, but passes over the houses that have the blood of the land, lamb, on them, above their doorpost. If you can't see the symbology there, the clear drawing between that and Yeshua, I'm covered by the blood of the lamb, that's what it means. So, they literally, death passes over the Passover, the houses of Israel. So they do that before they leave Mitzrayim, then they leave Mitzrayim, then a couple years later, here they are out in the wilderness, they perform the Passover again. Why did they skip a little bit of time? They had to build the tabernacle. Had to have a place to do it. So they perform the Passover again. Now they've wandered in the wilderness 40 years, they're on the doorstep of the promised land. And because no man who is uncircumcised of the children of Israel should take, should partake in the Passover, Yah tells Joshua to circumcise again all the guys who had been born and raised up during that 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. So they do. And then now, see, they were unable to perform that right because they wandered in the wilderness 40 years and they had all these dudes that weren't circumcised. We just read in Genesis 17 that no man shall partake of it uncircumcised. Now everybody's been circumcised. Now they can do the Passover again. So again, verse 9. And Yahuwah said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Mitzrayim from you. So the name of the place is called Gilgal to this day. And the children of Israel camped in Gilgal and performed the Pesach on the 14th day of the new moon at evening on the desert plains of Jericho. And they ate the stored grain of the land on the morrow after the Pesach, unleavened bread and roasted grain on the same day. So just as we do today, we have the Passover on day one and followed by seven days of the festival of unleavened bread, the festival of matzah, which is a delicious delicious festival you know people that don't know look from the outside looking in and they go man this sounds like a real burden this keeping of the law and I'm like are you kidding me we have to PT our asses into the ground because of how blessing how much of a blessing the feasts are yeah I hate eating fire roasted sheep and delicious rich foods for eight nine days in a row several times per year it's miserable believe me it's miserable lots of steak tacos yeah mazakos Matzah, ribeye, steak, tacos with fresh greens and horseradish. So burdensome. It's, it's a real burden to keep this law, I'll tell you. It's, it's a real burden. Um, but I digress. Okay. So. And I've got some notes. We're going to come back around. We're going to finish reading 5. And then I want to perhaps take Joshua 5 to a different place that I've never heard anybody talk about. And the manna ceased on the day after they had eaten the stored grain of the land. So they get into the promised land. There's grain there. And the father goes, I'm no longer going to give you manna. You're not wandering in the wilderness anymore. And there's a clear, or at least I think it will be clear when I explain it. There's a clear implication there. And the manna ceased on the day after they had eaten the stored grain of the land. And the children of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate the food of the land in Canaan that year. And it came to be when Joshua was in Jericho that he lifted his eyes and looked and saw a man, capital M, man, standing opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Yehoshua, Joshua, went to him and said to him, Are you for us 
or are you for our adversaries? And he said, No, for I have now come as captain of the host of Yahuwah. And Joshua fell on his face of the earth and did obeisance to him. What is my master saying to his servant? And the captain of the host of Yahuwah said to Joshua, Take your sandal off your feet, for the place where you stand is set apart. And Joshua did so. That is the end of verse 5, or the end of chapter 5. <clears throat> so anybody who has observed the feasts knows that the Holy Spirit moves hardcore during feast time. There is a lot of blessing. There is a lot of revelation. There is a lot of borderline prophesying. Uh, the Father reveals a lot of stuff to his people, and there's a lot of really good fellowship, but the, the Holy Spirit moves during feast times. And so now, <clears throat> let's get into this a little bit. Just a little bit. And I have in my notes what's been titled, The Three Miracles or the Three Works <clears throat> at Gilgal. Now, three is the number, not numerology, numerics, the number of completeness. In Hebrew culture, if you have three of something, you have three of everything. You have everything, okay? Um, we see this over and over again. The Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, the Torah, the Prophets, the Resurrection. Um, three. Three means completeness. Okay, so the first miracle, the first of the great works at Gilgal was Joshua and the priests crossing over dry land. Priests stand in the middle of the river and the water stops. And all of Israel, three to five million men, women, three to five million men, no, men and women, 603,000, I think, men, three to five million men and women and their flocks and their herds and everybody just walk across dry land across the river Jordan as the water piles up and heaps up around them because the priests are standing in the middle of the river. <clears throat> this is directly indicative of Moshe, Moses, splitting the Red Sea. Yah split it, but Moshe was the vehicle that was used to do it, Okay. The second miracle or great work that was done at Gilgal was the renewing of the covenant, the circumcision, the covenant of Abraham that everybody, every man of age within the children, within the nation of Israel <clears throat> was circumcised and they renewed that covenant. They observed Passover and unleavened bread which is highly indicative of the covenant, the blood of the lamb. Unleavened bread is the removal of sin. That's how we celebrate unleavened bread. We consider leaven to be sin. Remember that the next time some shady pastor passes around a, a, the offering plate and makes the comment that a little leaven leavens the whole bunch. Leaven is sin. Where you see leaven in the Bible, it's sin. A little bit of sin corrupts all of us. It corrupts everything. So probably not the best phrase to make when the plate comes passing in front of you. Oh, yeah, a little leaven leavens the whole bunch. Ugh, read your Bible. So unleavened bread. During the Feast of Unleavened Bread, we don't eat leavened bread. We eat unleavened bread. We reflect on the sin in our life and the false teachings and false doctrines in our lives. And we purge that from us. We get all the leaven out of our house. Physically get all the leaven out of our house. And we physically get all the leaven out of our house, our temple. Get rid of all that bull crap. They did this. Additionally, there was no more manna. They went from being spoon fed by the Most High every day during that initial building of a relationship that now they committed themselves to him, to Yah, they're no longer being spoon fed. Now that they've got to learn to eat on their own. It's there, it's there for them to get, but he's not spoon feeding them anymore. <clears throat> and then you have 
Yeshua himself, who appears as the commander of the army to Joshua. This is not an angel. And we know this because some people would say, look, it's the Archangel Michael, the captain of the host. We don't bow to angels. Just so we're all clear here. And there is, there is a subset of false worship that revolves around adoration, worship of angels. We don't bow to them. Read the book of Revelation. They're awesome, but we don't bow to them. They are, in fact, jealous of us because we were created in Yah's image and we have direct communication to him. We were built to worship him. They work at our pleasure, not the other way around. This is not an angel that Joshua is in the presence of. This is no less than Yeshua. How's that possible? He hasn't even been born yet. John 1, the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And there was not one thing that was made without the Word. Yeshua transcends time. And everywhere in this Bible, before Yeshua came and started his ministry here on earth, and then was hung upon a stake, that we see Yahuwah embodied as a man. We see Yeshua. When Melchizedek comes down off the mountain and blesses Abraham, that's Yeshua. When here, when Jacob wrestles with God, that's Yeshua. When <laughs> Joshua is in the presence of the captain of the host of Yahuwah, the host is the army. That's Yeshua. And so, <clears throat> and he's got a sword in his hand. And so, we can see in Exodus 15, 3, that Yahuwah is a warrior. Yahuwah is his name. And Yeshua and Yahuwah are one. The long tradition of being a warrior is something that is glanced over, if even addressed at all, by the modern church because they don't like to talk about all the violence in the Old Testament. It's like George Carlin said, God had a kid and he really mellowed out. We'll read the end of the book. Revelation 19, you see Yeshua with a sword. Again, this is a common theme, and he slays the entire world. And I'm not making that up. I've read Revelation 19 here enough times to make that point, and I'm going to leave that to you to go read Revelation 19. <clears throat> but here's the completeness of all of this. In Joshua 4, in the dry riverbed, you have Joshua, which is... And a type of, an archetype of Yeshua himself. Joshua and Yeshua, Yehoshua and Yeshua have the same name. They both mean salvation. They both lead the Father's people into the promised land. They both do many mighty works and miracles in Yahuwah's name. Okay? They are a type of one another. And so in Joshua 4... You have the dry river, which is directly indicative of Moses and the Red Sea. It's a confirmation and a remembrance. It confirms to the children of Israel that Joshua really is the guy. And it's a remembrance of what happened with Moshe when they crossed over the Red Sea. This is the Torah. This is a confirmation of the Torah, the law that Moses received. The second miracle, the renewing of the covenant, the great, and when I say miracle, I mean the great works, was the renewing of the covenant by the circumcision of the, all the men that had been born in the last 40 years, the partaking, partaking of the Pesach and the observance of unleavened bread. This is, <clears throat> believe it or not, directly related to the prophets. No longer are they eating the manna that's being spoon-fed to them, but now they've got to think for themselves. They're imbued, believe it or not, with the spirit of Yahuwah. People say the giving of the Holy Spirit comes in Acts 2, but elsewhere throughout this Old Testament, you can look everywhere and see the spirit of Yahuwah. They had the spirit on them. 
And when I say prophets, what do I mean by that? Flip to Isaiah 30. It's going to be flipping forward at this point. Isaiah 30, verse 20. We'll start at 19. For the people shall dwell in Zion at Jerusalem and shall weep no more. He shall show favor to you, grace to you, at the sound of your cry when he hears and he shall answer you. Though Yahuwah gave you bread of adversity and water of affliction. Bread of adversity, manna. Remember, they didn't enjoy eating the manna. Bread of adversity and water of affliction, or uh, maraba, which is where Miriam died. Waters of affliction. Though Yahuwah gave you bread of adversity and water of affliction, your teacher shall no longer be hidden, but your eyes shall see your teacher. This is Isaiah prophesying into the future. <clears throat> but just like what happens in the future is an archetype of the past, here is literally Yeshua. The day after their bread of affliction stops, while they're observing Passover and unleavened bread, literally celebrating being covered by the blood of the lamb who shows up and there stands a man but he's not just a man he's commander of Yahuwah's army he's Yeshua and Yeshua comes to Joshua and so we have the dry Jordan River confirmation and remembrance of Moshe with the Torah and we have the performing of this renewing of the covenant which is prophetic towards Torah prophets, prophetic towards Yeshua. And then we literally have <clears throat> Yeshua showing up as the commander of the Father's army with the sword in his hand. And he said, No, for I have come as captain of the host of Yahuwah. And Yeshua fell on his face to the earth and did obeisance. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and did obeisance to him and said, what is my master saying to his servant? And the captain of the host said to Joshua, take your sandal off your foot for the place where you stand is set apart. And Joshua did so. He was in the presence of the most high because he was physically looking upon Yeshua, who is Yahuwah, just a different facet of Yahuwah. And so this is highly indicative of Yeshua, which is the embodiment of the resurrection and the judgment to come at the end of an age. And so here in this, just Joshua chapter 5, we have these three archetypes, these three instances of the archetype of what is to come. We have the confirmation and remembrance of the Torah. We have the observance of the feasts and the prophetic outlook of the feasts towards Yeshua, then we have Yeshua himself embodied to bring power, strength, authority, judgment, resurrection. So Torah, prophets, resurrection, right here in this one chapter. And all of this points towards much like, in my humble opinion, much like Moses and Pharaoh, where Moses had to learn to grow and walk in that power and authority from Yah. This is all confirmation again for Joshua. And all of this is generally skipped over when you get to Joshua 6. And we're not going to read Joshua 6 today. But Joshua 6 is the fall of Jericho. The Israelites take Jericho and the walls come tumbling down. It's as if we conveniently forget, if we've ever been taught at all, that the falling of the walls of Jericho was not preceded by seven days of walking around the walls. It was preceded by a confirmation and a remembrance of the Torah, the observance of the Passover and unleavened bread, the rejoicing and the covering of the lamb, the encouragement by the Father to quit being spoon-fed and start feeding yourselves, and the literal appearance of Yeshua of Nazareth as Jesus the Christ 
to Joshua and all of Israel, the implication, as the commander of the army of Yahuwah before the walls of Jericho fall and that entire nation is put under the ban, completely wiped out. Where do you suppose these children of Israel got the strength and authority and power that was required of them to encourage those walls of Jericho to fall down? They were indwelt with the spirit of Yahuwah. And I would submit the reason why they were was because they were literally living out the embodiment of the Torah, the prophets, and the resurrection. And they had Yeshua with them. What more could you ask for? And so for me, that's what I tease out of Joshua 4, Joshua 5 rather, because I am trying to live my life to the best of my ability as the embodiment of the Torah, the prophets, and the resurrection, and to keep Yeshua with me as much as possible so that I can do as many mighty works as possible. So that if I need to march around a wall for seven days, literally or figuratively, to get that wall to fall down, I can. I hope this was a blessing to you. I hope you read along with your Bibles. I hope that you are not subcontracting your faith to me because I mean it when I say I'm just a man and I failed myself enough times to know it's just a matter of time before I fail you. Have a blessed day. Shalom, y'all.